Good morning or good afternoon, depending on the case. My name is Jorge Soberon. I am a professor at the University of Kansas, and I will be talking this, this today with you about uh, the, the kind of structure that niches have. In my previous talk, we said I said that uh, there are two main ideas in, in niche theory, and one of them is that niches have structure measured in units of fitness. Um, this, in, in the other talk, I use this idea to, to, to support the argument that niches are fundamental or, or realized or existing and things like that. In today's talk, I am going to develop the idea that the niche have a, f a fitness structure uh, to show that uh, there is a function uh, from environmental variables to fitness and that this gives niche space the structure and I'm going to review some of the implications for uh, species uh, distribution modeling and for ecological niche modeling. Remember, the two are not the same. In the famous paper of 1957, Hutchinson implicitly defined niche in terms of fitness, um, but the, he didn't develop the idea very much. It was not until 20 years after that Bassett McGuire, in an important paper in the American Naturalist, uh, developed the idea that the fitness values inside a niche would have an orderly structure uh, going from highest in the center of the niche or in some region central to the niche uh, shape and decreasing towards uh, the outside parts and that there would be um, a, a, a value of, of zero in, in fitness measured as units of intrinsic growth rate. Zero is the, the, the boundary between populations that will go extinct and populations that will uh, 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 remain and be viable. So Maguire was the first one, 20 years after Hutchinson, that developed the idea of a structure in the, in the niche shape. And he also uh, suggested that niches could be something like ovoid structures. In other words, that the structure of niche would be convex. Maguire was using the old idea of niche in which uh, types of variables are mixed. Remember that in our world of niche modeling and species distribution modeling, we use xenopoietic variables, which are those that are not interactive or that interact very slowly with population sizes. Um, so um, remember that. Uh, in, 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 in the graph that you are um, seeing in this slide, there are three xenopoietic variables, climat climatic variables, uh, temperature, uh, precipitation, and precipitation of the driest month for North America. So the idea of niche having a fitness structure is that different, uh, if, if I go and take fitness measures of populations in each one of those points, the measures are going to be different in a non-random way. To establish the fitness structure of niches, we essentially would require experiments. And there are very few uh, experiments done at more than one dimension. Um, the, the, the best database that I know for, for experimental estimation of the limits of tolerance of something, of species, which are the measures of niche, uh, are for a single variable, one dimension, which is temperature. And, uh, and the database is shown there, it's called Globetherm. For two dimensions, I have found less than 10 papers, perhaps. There is one example in the figure to the right of the, of the slide. And for three or more dimensions, I don't know a single one. Properly done with, uh, with balance experiments with enough replicates and things. So um, this is this is this is a fact of life. Experiments would allow measuring the fitness-related parameters of the fundamental niche, but these experiments are very very rare. Despite the fact that um, few experiments are in regards to the structure of niche in many variables measuring fitness, the idea is very important 
it has all sorts of consequences for population dynamics, for genetics, for evolution. One would expect that fitness would be higher in the center of the niche structure. E, and uh, also one would expect that this genetic structure would vary regularly in different parts of the niche. Uh, to the right, you see um, an estimation of, uh, of the niche using data points, which is, means that maybe it's not a very good estimation of the actual fundamental niche, but for illustration purposes only. So you see uh, a shape of um, red points, which, is, uh, which are the climates in three var variables for the world and the the green and blue um, region is the niche of a species of of dove which was estimated in in all the the localities we had in the old world and you see that we are assuming that the fitness is highest in the center part is the blue the, the blue regions becomes greener meaning less va lower values of, of 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 fitness to yellow and then there is an outline which you can see in in blue which is the boundary of zero fitness and outside the 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 the, the niche outside that boundary all the values are negative so the species will not be able to survive there would be there would not be viable populations outside the niche whereas inside the niche there would be viable populations and the fitness would be highest towards the center if we do a um, typical um, algorithm of niche modeling like a maxent or practically any uh, uh, any method will do this, uh, yield a similar result we and we plot the results of the output of the algorithm in niche space we see that uh, there is some structure in the output of our of a, of a climatic niche model or an environmental niche model speaking in general in the image to the right the black dots are the 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 points that were the occurrence points that were used to calibrate the algorithm and the and the colored points is the output of a max the raw output of a maxent uh, um, calculation and you see that there is an orange in the center of the of the cloud which is the highest values of the raw output of maxent and then it starts uh, changing towards blue blue is smaller values and outside you can you can Im with your imagination trace uh, 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 an ellipsoid around that cloud of blue points so outside the values would be much smaller and smaller and smaller um, the ellipsoid shape is not casual maxent despite of what some people believe cannot trace but conic curves so only paraboloids ellipsoids or hyperboloids that's what maxent can do and that is an ellipsoid uh, traced by, by Maxent. Uh, every point in the cloud, including the black points, very, very, very much uh, to, the, to the left of the, of the colored region, would also have a raw value. But we uh, arbitrarily uh, assigned uh, an, um, a level curve, uh, a, a threshold, and values larger than that threshold are painted in blue greens and, and and oranges and yellows and values outside that arbitrary threshold are not painted at all so since the output of an uh, uh, an ecological niche modeling algorithm like maxent uh, are order in 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 niche space that means that we can use it to predict the fitness well, not really, and not specifically not a measure of fitness, which is population abundance. Uh, and why not? Well, because what an algorithm, a niche modeling algorithm, does is not is is not um, um, designed to estimate a fitness. It's designed to estimate a similarity with those environments in which we have reported observations. It's not a fitness value, therefore not in itself, it's a niche. 
How, however, it may be possible to find some, re and, and not surprisingly, people have not found um, consistent relationships between population abundance, for instance, which is a measure of fitness, and uh, values of the raw output of Maxent. But if you order the outputs of a Maxent algorithm in order, then there is a relationship uh, between the output of an eco ecological niche molding algorithm and measures of fitness like population abundance. To the right, you see one example uh, where we see that in the x-axis we are plotting the Mahalanobis distance to the ecological niche centroid. Remember that Mahalanobis distance is a distance metric that takes into account covariance co between the variables. So close to the origin points are very, very, very close to the to the centroid of of the uh, of the um, uh, output of the Maxent uh, uh, modeling, and very far to the right are points which are very much um, away from the centroid. And in the y-axis, uh, we see the observed abundance of populations of the species that is mentioned in the, in the caption of the, of, the, of the figure. And there is a covariance in some cases. The pioneer work in this uh, uh, field of, of uh, finding uh, correlations between population abundance in, 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 in populations and distance to the centroid of the niche was done by Enrique Martinez Meyer. Uh, and uh, he and his co-authors suggested that the fitness measure can be population density. And again, what matters is not distance to the geographic centroid as the classical abundance center hypothesis of biogeography stated, but what matters is distance to the centroid of the niche. Uh, and that's a, a very major uh, difference because if you remember Hutchinson's duality, the topology between distances in geographic space and distances in environmental space is complicated and it's not uh, a simple relationship. Now, I have been uh, talking all the time about the centroid of a niche, but centroid means the centroid of some geometric shape. What is the shape of a fundamental niche? This is a very interesting question, uh, be beginning with the, the fact that the fundamental niche is a concept. So what is the shape of this concept? Well, there are three major ideas. It, this is a complicated topic to go into all the details, but I am going to, to go f uh, the, uh, in, in the simplest way I can. There are three major ideas in the literature. First, Hutchinson thought that niches were parallel pipettes, uh, rectangular shapes in, multi, in, in, in multiple dimensions. Then Maguire, 20 years afterwards, uh, thought, well, maybe they are ellipsoids because they have some covariance. Uh, and that has been also uh, the same idea that many people use, uh, Jim Brown, uh, Drake, ourselves, Down Peterson, myself, we think that uh, we, we, we don't think they are ellipsoids, but we act as if they were ellipsoids. And finally, other group of people have used convex holes. Uh, and there is a big difference. This is not, the, it is not equivalent to assume whatever shape look at the figure at the right. It's the same cloud of data points in the same environment, same species, only the the, the niche was modeled in the left using um, a, a convex hole and the niche was mod modeled in the right with an ellipsoid. And you can see that the co correlation with with um, with the, between Euclidean distance to the centroid and abundance it's not very good at all. Actually, it's quite bad with less than 1% of the variance explained when you model the, the niche with a convex hull and use Euclidean distances. Whereas the correlation is quite good 
in the right where Nietzsche was modeled and therefore the centroid we're talking about is the centroid of the ellipsoid uh, and we use a Mahalanobis distance to measure distances and the correlation is much much better so uh, the, 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 the morale of this story is that um, although a fundamental niche is a concept not every concept of fundamental niche is equivalent right now we prefer to use ellipsoids we know that we will have to modify this eventually in the future okay so um, I have argued that there is probably um, a regular uh, structure to the niche to the fundamental niche and that may be perhaps an ellipsoid at, at a first approximation and that um, uh, structure in the fitness uh, shape creates a structure in the in how fitness is uh, related um, distributed in geographical space and uh, that may have um, well implications for measuring abundance of population uh, of populations uh, according to where they are located in each space in order to do this in a more in a more rigorous way i'm going to use equations and i am going to use a system of differential differential equations that correspond to the bam diagram you remember the bam diagram the venn diagram that that intersects uh, and the intersection of the tree is where you find a population of, of, uh, of an animal or a plant and the three circles are the, the environmental niche, the interactions with other species and the M uh, circle which means the movements. You can translate that into equations you see in the first the, the first equation in, in in the slide i am plotting the population growth rate of a of a species in a, in a grid of cells and this is growth rate in the in the ith uh, cell of the grid there are n cells so i can go one two three all the way to n so this is for the ith uh, cell and what I see is that I, I have first an R, which is the intrinsic growth rate. This corresponds to the A circle in the BAM diagram. Then I have interactions. In this case, it's just um, uh, self interactions with the same species because I am not considering more equations for competition or for predator prey or for mutualistic interactions. So. The, the interactions term, the second term in the first parenthesis, is the B of the of the BAM diagram, and finally I have two sums to describe movements: movements from a cell to other cells, and movements from other cells to the cell in question. Um, and there is also a, se a second parenthesis in the equation for an alley effect, which turns out to be very important, but is not considering in, in, in traditional niche theory. So if we assume that the intrinsic growth rate, which is denoted by R sub I, is uh, depends on the distance to the centroid of the niche and that everything else is not dependent on distance to the, to, is not affected by environmental values, then we have that the, var the R value depends on the Mahalanobis distance to the centroid of the fundamental niche. And we are assuming that movement depends only on distance and assuming that there is an alley effect. Well, the results of doing this are very interesting. When we solve that very complicated system of equations, and this is a software that already is in existence, developed by Luis Osorio, one of the two co-authors co of this talk, uh, you can solve the equation. And you can see that you have to start somewhere and the population starts growing and growing and growing, and that uh, in the end, when 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 you get a steady state, when there is things are not changing anymore, uh, the 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 correlation between distance to the centroid and number of individuals in every one of the cells of the grid is very good, is negative and very very good. But this is assuming that there is no 
uh, Ali effect. So um, watch the simulation. I have been talking, and the simulation has been taking place one or two times. You see in the in the left part of the panel, it's the spatial uh, spread of the population on a grid, and on the right side is how the the relationship between distance of Mahalanobis distance the the Mahalanobis distance between the centroid in the niche to the environment in each one of the cells in the map uh, and the number of individuals that uh, of, of populations in each one of those grids uh, change and you see that at, at the, the very beginning the relationship is very bad but in the end it becomes very good if we re repeat the simulation but now including the Ali effect the results are very different Although by, the, by, by construction of the model, if you start a population in a cell, the, the, the density, the, the final density of the population in that cell is going to be proportional to the distance to the Mahalanobis, uh, to, the, uh, to the distance to the centroid, to the Mahalanobis distance to the centroid. That is the way we, we created the, the, the niche structure. However, by allowing movement to take place, you have to define where the, the dispersal begins, which is like the initial conditions for the solving the differential equations. And you see that the now, since there is a barrier in uh, separating the, the upper left side of the map and the lower right side of the map, the lower right side cannot be colonized because there is an Ali effect and therefore you are going to end with a lot of cells that are perfectly suitable but they are not colonized they have zero uh, population density and that means that your correlation between population abundance and distance to the centroid is not going to be good there are important implications of uh, the above considerations uh, we expect it is natural to to imagine that niches have structure and that the inside the closest to the central part of whatever shape we are using to define the centroid is going to have the highest measures of fitness but that doesn't mean that the, the that is going to to project as simply as that into geographic space because the dispersal and the interactions complicate things tremendously so if you start with good dispersers use an ellipsoid as a model not other shapes not for instance a convex hole and use mahalanobis as a formula for distance one indeed gets uh, there is a tendency to find negative correlations between abundance and distance to the centroid to the right you see four examples uh, of four different species in a paper that is uh, in press in Ecology Letters by Luis Osorio Olvera and other authors and uh, where this is described from an empirical perspective. It is important, I mean, although one expects as maybe the null hypothesis that there would be a relationship between position in each space and abundance of populations there are several complicating features that can completely upset this correlation. So one has to have some theory before going about just looking for correlations. I think that the above is extremely interesting. It opens the avenue to, to a lot of research in ecology and in population genetics, in biogeography and in evolution. It suggests experiments field work, more theoretical development is needed um, and I believe that all of you should stop doing whatever you are doing and start working on the fitness structure of the niche. Well, the last part was a joke. So, concluding, since the beginning of niche theory, people thought that uh, the niche should have some structure in fitness terms. And this is an important idea not only because it implies those differences in, in types of niche, like uh, the fundamental niche, the realized niche, and so on, 
but also because it suggests that perhaps when you do uh, ecological niche modeling that may give you some idea on the on, 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 on the fitness of a population and this is like a big jump from the theoretical ideas of niche theory to the actual practice of ecological niche modeling um, and indeed theory when you do some theory immediately you see that there are complications and I described a few Ali effects type of distance metric Euclidean versus uh, versus Mahanovis, the shape of the niche ellipsoid versus convex hole transitory effects and all this uh, all this are described in the paper by Osorio et al in, Nicole, in, in ecography and other complications that I didn't mention like for instance asymmetric niche shapes and interactions that are described by another paper by Bob Holt in 2019. When all these complications are taken into account, one can indeed find empirical relationships between the position of a population in each space and fitness measurements like abundance. And I think this is a very nice result. And finally, uh, what I just said, uh, it's evidence of important things. The fundamental niche can be somewhat approximated using occurrence data. This is this is maybe a bit unexpected. It's difficult to know when it's happening and when it is not happening. But just the fact that we find correlations between abundance and distance to a centroid suggests that we are approximating the fundamental niche when do do the niche modeling uh, algorithms. Second, that the shape of the fundamental niche may be approximately ellipsoidal. Again, we find correlations when we use ellipsoidal shapes and we don't find correlations when you, we use convex holes. So maybe uh, niche, uh, fundamental niches are to some degree ellipsoidal. Finally, and this is, this is just to stress thing that we have said many, many times in the past, uh, modeling distributions in geography and modeling niches in abstract spaces are different endeavors with different purposes, with different theory and different methods. Both are interesting, both are useful, they are intrinsically related, but they are different things. There is no point in assuming that modeling a distribution in geography is the same as modeling a niche in environmental space. Finally, the theoretical analysis shows that the effects of movements and niche preferences are entangled in ways that right now we don't know how to separate. Uh, maybe we will in the future, this is uh, an area of research, but uh, the bottom line is that we need to be careful when using the output of um, ecological niche models to analyze fitness because there are complications. Thank you very much for your attention.